Because you were in Manhattan last night. That's why we're talking. Is because I was in Manhattan. Because last you were night. in Manhattan. That's what it comes down to. And now we're here. Hey everybody. I am delighted <laughs> that I have my longtime friend, brother, collaborator, yes. traveling musician. Mm. He's now snuggling up in his blanket. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Mangione, everybody. Mike and I, we've known each other for over 20 years, right? Uh, that's probably true. <laughs> and we are here to talk about Mike's brand new album, mm -hmm. which is called, tell us what it's called. It's called Blood and Water. It came out um, October 21st, so. Just a uh, few days ago. A few days ago. And we're gonna talk about our love of music. We're gonna talk about how that intersects with St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body. And I wanna begin with a quote that I don't even know if you've ever heard this before, but it's one of my favorites from Pope Benedict XVI. Listen to this one, Mike. He says, music uncovers the buried way to the heart, the core of our being, where it touches the being of the creator and redeemer. Wherever this is achieved, and I love here that he's, he's not making a distinction between sacred music and secular yeah. music. He's saying wherever this is achieved, when you hear a song and it cracks you open, when you hear a song and it brings a tear to your eye, puts a lump in your throat, or just moves you, and you know something is stirring in your heart, this is what Pope Benedict's getting at, wherever this is achieved, music becomes the road that leads to Christ, the way on which God shows his salvation. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> my favorite quote of Benedict was, quote, when he said, you got to fight, dot, 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 for your right. To party. Dot, 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 to party. But that wasn't, that was. End quote. Well, that was, that was now you're messing with me, yes. and we're live on YouTube. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? Sorry, you did tee up. A you're supposed to throw, <laughs> you're, th you're throwing me. I'm going to bury it. Here we go. <laughs> and done. <laughs> Sorry. That's a way to wed the sacred and the secular right there on live YouTube. Yeah. By throwing in the Beastie Boys. Yeah. Well, okay. So going back to that quote. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I, when, when talking about my biggest influences, because I know that's what you just asked, um, John Paul II is right up there. And I feel like he's, and, and Benedict in that quote is kind of carrying out the, the letter to artist kind of vibe yeah 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 um that that was always when john paul ii acknowledged that even he's, he's i'm paraphrasing but even in the times of reflecting on the darkness you're in some way reflecting on the creator it opened up a whole new world of affirmation it, it affirmed my feelings because <laughs> that's important uh, but it, it affirmed like kind of where music kind of sat not just me. your feelings it affirmed your your gut sense of reality and your experience of the world and your experience of music and your yeah. experience of art, which is what connected us to begin with. Right. Um, this whole quote, the re reason I wanted to start with this. Yeah. I'm sorry about killing You should right be. I, <laughs> um, I because it's our experience. I mean, yeah. this, is, this, is what, this is how you and I formed a bond in, in when, we, when we met. Tell the story of how yeah. you and I so, met. So, I was attending Marquette University, and uh, there's a great Jesuit priest that was there at the time, and he said he got my girlfriend to go see this new, young speaker that's speaking on TOB, Theology of the Body, and uh, she was all excited. He got her excited about it, and then uh, naturally, as the boyfriend, I wanted to go too, and so I think it was like three a three-day... Yeah, it was a three-day retreat. It was started a on a Friday one. night and ended on a Sunday. Yeah, and I sat there and like just honestly, ninety eight percent of it went right over my head, and I just didn't understand. But I knew that what you were laying out before us was, it was like answering questions that I had always had. It was like it, the two percent that you got was answering. The two percent was like hitting something. <laughs> I was like, oh no, this is like responsibility and a challenge. But yeah, and then you played a song, which is funny because you, I have never seen you play a song bef before since. Yeah, know? there was a guitar and I, I picked it up and. Yeah, what was that all about? Why, why were you doing that? I don't know. Somebody had a guitar and I felt the inspiration. So I picked yeah. it up and sang a song. Yeah, it's a good thing you didn't know I was in the audience because you would have been nervous. I did know you were in the audience because <laughs> I'm scanning the audience that yeah. night looking out and my little radar is going beep over your head. 
And I'm thinking, I was like this. Yeah, this guy this, like, does not want to be here. Yeah, I did. And I thought, man, this is going to be a long weekend for this guy. I was there for the snacks. And <laughs> you were there, I figured out, within a, just a matter of moments because the girl sitting right next to you. And I was like, okay, this, this, guy, this guy needs a little, uh, I don't know, TLC. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like literally TLC the band at the time? No. It, okay. Tender, loving, loving, care. Okay. So you came up. Uh, at the, did you come up or did I yeah, put you? Yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah. Um, so What's yeah. funny for us to tell the story is Mike and I have been traveling the world for the last 15 plus years. Mike is the resident artist musician at the Theology of the Body Institute. We've traveled the world together. Yeah. But telling the story of how we met and how we went from that evening where we grabbed a guitar and stayed up till two in the morning sharing songs. Yeah. So and we had no, I mean, we had, we had no way of knowing at that time where our friendship was, was going to go. Well, there's a, there's two layers to, to this experience because yeah, like you played a song. I wanted to talk to you. I've never told you this, but I wanted to talk to you because you were, what you were delivering was true and I couldn't enter into what you're delivering, but I could enter into the song. I could talk about that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. that's like level playing field. I could, right. I can't meet you, I can't like meet you theologically, but I could talk about music. And so I, I said to you, I, I enjoyed the song yep, and you that. said, Oh, do you, do you play? I said, yes. And you said, who, who are your, who do you listen to? Yeah. And I said the magic words. I said, I love, I love, um, Barry Manilow. <laughs> Come on now, A Mike. Good warm fire. And Snuggies. No, I, I said, I, no, I love you too. And Bob Dylan, those are my people. And like your face lit up. You like you too? That's my that's my my band. I said, oh, cool. And then you, you asked, you're like, you're gonna be around for a little bit. Can we hang out and talk? And I said, yeah. And I just remember what was so great about that hang that time was that this person that I just witnessed just lay out this theological foundation that went right over my head was now talking to me about the experiences of touring because you had some band yep. years under your yep. belt. Yep. And so we were able to connect at that level and we just talked music. And that was it. And then you came back. Uh, so you had an, there's an impact. I felt comfortable. All right. If this guy that I feel comfortable with um, can hang with me like this, then maybe what he's proposing is not crazy. And thankfully, my girlfriend at the time was into it and that priest was into it because I had a little community. Um, but that wasn't it, though. That wasn't like, I mean, it was like burning a little bit. You know, I acknowledged that, what I experienced, but. You know, being a student in college was easy to quickly forget, you know, but it was really that second visit where you came and you, you recognized me and and you. Well, I didn't recognize you. Right. So I came back to the Milwaukee area like three years later. Yeah. And I saw your girlfriend out in the audience. Who's now my wife. Who's now your wife. Yes. But it looked like she was with another guy. Yeah. And she came up at the break to say hi with this, what I thought was another guy. And I, it was very awkward, but I pulled her aside. I said, what, what happened to Mike? Where's, where's Mike? And she said, he's right here. And I looked over at you and I, I didn't recognize you. Why didn't yeah. I not recognize you? Because I, ha- I had lost about 40 pounds. You had lost a lot of weight. You had yeah. cut your hair. I thought you were a different dude. Like you yeah. had been like a tank. Yeah, I kind of, ent- I slid into college after playing football in high school, seriously, like hardcore football. And so I was two, I was 200 pounds, five foot five, <laughs> five little, foot five, yeah. 200 pounds. When I met you with long hair. Yeah. And Which then is you, always a good combination. You cut your hair and you were down to like 150 or 160. Yeah. So I didn't recognize you. And then I looked at you like, Mike. And you, you say, yeah, I'm, it's Mike. And I said, gosh, what happened? And you tell everybody how you lost the weight. <laughs> well, uh, I, I got on a, a really kind of, uh, amazing diet plan called salmonella poisoning. <laughs> 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 Which is awesome because in two weeks I shed a lot of weight. Uh, yeah, I got sick, but um, but yeah, I think and not to go down this alley, but it, it, with with the effort in football, I was kind of pushing my body in a direction that once I got sick, it kind of reset my where I was supposed to be, which is 115 pounds. And <laughs> <laughs> I had a I had an epiphany when I saw you again because I was forming a little U2 cover band, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which you'll remember. <laughs> And I said, Mike, uh, do you want to be part of this little YouTube cover band, Daniel Da Silva, and you and I 
got together for a weekend of practices. Yeah. We had one show yep. at the Chameleon here in Lancaster, PA. Yep. Uh, but that forming that little trio th between you and me and Daniel Da Silva. That was the glue. That was the glue. Yeah. Um, I remember I was sleeping in your basement and Thomas, you were like, gosh, you had to be like. He was five years old. Five. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Um, but <laughs> I remember you waking me up one morning because your drum set was in the basement. Uh, that silver, right, that like right. Thomas near, Swing Star. You you woke me up by playing drums next to my head. Did I really? Yeah, I did that cruel thing to you. Yeah, which was the first time and last time that's ever happened, and that definitely wakes one up. That does wake. Did I? What did I come down and do a drum fill or what? Yes, yeah, probably some kind of Larry Mullen influenced uh -huh. thing that forced me. And out that asleep. endeared you to me forever. It made me. It definitely made me feel comfortable not liking you. <laughs> Which is now very. I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> very so easy. from there, let's let's go yeah. from that was 2004 uh, wow. that we that we did that, and I remember you gave me a CD of some of your songs. I had a new record coming out yep. called There and Back, right? And I I had an advanced copy that I I gave to you, and I get a lot of CDs from people who hand me listen to my music, listen to my music because people know I like music, yeah, and. I didn't, I knew you had chops, I knew you could sing, I knew you could play the guitar, but I didn't know if you could write songs. Yeah. And I remember putting your CD in and I was taken right away because I, I discovered in your music, uh, you were an artist of the ache, yeah. like you sang from a place of hunger, you sang from a place of longing. Yeah. And your vocals were very vulnerable and... I'm always drawn in by a, a vocalist who cracks open his rib cage and, and pours it out. And I really felt that in your in the way you sang and in your songwriting. And that was the beginning of thinking, I I could imagine Mike's music being part of what I do. Hmm. And I've always loved music. I've been in a lot of bands myself. Uh, I never really realized, though, when I started out, I started out kind of more, um, I mean, I studied academic theology, and then I'm trying to translate it for a popular audience. Yeah. And doing that over and over again, you're running into, okay, how do I make a connection? I need to, I have a, a, a message I want to share, but if it just stays up in the head, yeah. It's, it's not going to connect. It's not going to land with my audience. And so I started bringing music into what I did. That's what you experienced at that retreat. That's why I grabbed that guitar, because music has a way. Let me go back to Benedict here. Music uncovers the buried way to the heart, yeah. the core of our being, where it touches the being of the Creator and Redeemer. This is why I see music as indispensable in, in evangelization. Yeah. And when when I listened to that CD there and back that you gave me, that's when I started thinking I can I can envision Mike's music wedded with this teaching mm -hmm. in a way that can really uncover the buried way to people's hearts. And our first gig together, actually we did something in Chicago. Yeah. When yeah, was yeah. that? Uh well, when was that? Yeah, was it 2005, 2006, something? It had yeah, it was about that. Yeah, because 07 was when we did our first jaunt together in Australia. 08. 08 uh, was fine, world whatever. Yeah. Agree to disagree, you know. <laughs> it was 08. Don't, I just don't remember Google these dates. World Youth Day. <laughs> world Youth Day, Sydney, Australia, 2008. The reason I know that is because my wife was pregnant with Grace. Okay. And Grace was born in just a couple weeks after I got back from World Youth Day. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, music is always, it's funny, as I, I reflect that, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older now from these days we're talking about, and I've, I've had a, more albums and more performances and more writing. And one, one thing I didn't realize, you know, it's funny when you, you kind of like coagulate your, your effort and like your, your way of doing things as you get older, you reflect on it, is music has always been a very serious thing for me. It's never been ear candy it's never been yeah. a danceable thing you can dance to it but it's always a very serious conversation not by choice it's just always pulled me in that way you know like when when i was young <laughs> when people talk about like who they grew up listening to you know 
I was young in the eighties and nineties. That was kind of like my developmental period. Um, I missed a few days, but I'm still, I'm doing okay. <laughs> um, but like, it was always as a young kid, I was listening to Bob Dylan. I was listening to Bob Marley. I was listening to the, to Zeppelin. That's, and the that's and unusual. Was it, it was, very was it your older brothers who were cluing yeah. you in? Well, the older brothers are definitely, well, specifically my, the middle brother, Tom, who plays in my band was, was kind of putting this stuff in front of me, but that doesn't necessarily influence the way you engage it. I was, for whatever reason, I was really engaging it because it was, you know what it was? Okay. I've always had a hard time communicating as you, you people, can you tell people will experience. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've always had a hard time communicating and music has, has been, uh, a very, um, it, it, music just kind of sums up. Well, it's a universal language. Yeah. When, when words are difficult and, and forming an idea to express something is difficult for me, music expresses it in three minutes. And so I love dwelling in that place. And so as a kid, I would, uh, sit in my room and I made my room like in the, into like this, like sacramental experience I had li Christmas lights and, you know, black lights and incense. And I had like this mint coffee I'd always make. And I would just sit in my room and listen to music because it, it like, it would lift me up and put me somewhere that I couldn't go. I couldn't go right. vocally. I couldn't talk about what, right. you know, I can't talk about it. <laughs> Look at me now. Like I can't talk about it, but music like suspends me in that place of who am I? What am I? Where am I going? And you know, that's right away that got a hold of me. And that's where I've been ever since. So like when people say like, explain the song, can you explain yeah. like, what's that? I can't, I did it. It's in the it's song. It's in the song, right? <laughs> that's it. And it's something you have to feel more than uh, analyze. Um, yeah. And this is how I actually introduce you at our live events. T tonight, we're going to Baltimore. Tomorrow, we're going to be in Nashville doing our Made for More event. And your music is integral to how we do what we do yeah. in presenting the, the theology of the body. But it's, it's unusual for people because we're in a church and they're expecting hymns or yeah. praise and worship music. But that's not you. I introduce you and I say... I say Mike is kind of like a, a Catholic Bob Dylan. He's a storyteller. He's a troubadour. And, and yeah, pay attention to his lyrics, because we'll have them up on the screen. But more than that, Mike's music is something you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable to and feel. Yeah. And then I tell the story, you know the story, of, what was this, three, four years ago, we were in Kansas... And we had a deaf community come to our event, mm -hmm. and we had a sign language tra uh, interpreter of the event for the deaf people. And at the end of the night, through the translator, this deaf person approached me, and we were having a conversation. And I said, what was the highlight of the night? And through the, the sign language interpreter, I learned the highlight of the night for this deaf woman was your music. That's right. And I was baffled. I was like, um... Sorry, help me understand this. Uh, I didn't th you hear me <laughs> speaking for? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, <Did> you not. <laughs> it would, would, obviously, yeah. the reason I'm I'm surprised is because she's mm -hmm. deaf. How how did her music bless you? And right. she said, "I felt the vibrations through the floor, yeah. and they came up through my feet into my heart. And when Mike cracked his heart open, my heart got cracked open. Yeah, that was." an amazing experience to me of how just the vibration of your heart. Yeah. Presence and delivery. I mean, like I, when I, when you, it's an instrument, like all that stuff, everything that you bring to performance can be used as an instrument in delivering the message of the song. So I always say silence is like my, if I'm ever playing solo, I, I look at it like a duo. And silence is the other member because you have to use it. You have to have the negative spaces so that what you're doing actually stands out. Yeah. And that took like to get to that point took years of playing and realizing I don't sound very good. Like, it, it, what do you mean you don't sound very well, good? Well, when I was first starting out, I was playing often and I was tr really trying to like fill space. But if you're just trying to fill space, you're, it's going to be nonsense. Like I wasn't utilizing the negative space to make what I was doing more potent. And so if you 
take pauses, people lean in. Yeah, I've seen listen. you do this. I've yeah. seen you in action countless times. Just communication. And and I've seen you know how to make a connection with your audience. Like before we went on air here, you were telling me about your show last night in Manhattan. Yeah. And and how you have 45 minutes. Yeah. You have a slot. There are other musicians lined up. And I said, well, that sounds like stand-up comedy. You got to get up and and land the joke right away if you're a stand-up comedian or people tune out. And you had to do this just last night in Manhattan. Can you walk yeah. us walk us through that? Yeah. So so certain certain markets like Man, uh, New York and Los Angeles, uh, New Orleans occasionally have these kind of um, venues where they're just slots and you fill the slot. So, I mean, obviously, if you're like huge, you have your own time and it's a different, but I'm not huge. I'm, I'm, I'm just me. So, so there's this place that I, I, I love playing. It's so not ideal. Like it's a small room. It's called the Rockwood Music Hall Stage One. It's a small room, one side of, you know, facing the streets, all windows. So you just see people moving. And then it, uh, it's, you have 45 minutes to get up there and kind of win over this audience. And then you got to get out of there. So there's so much that, is against what performance is like there's you can't rest you can't relax you can't pray you can't be vulnerable you can't like automatically just like enter into it you have to like okay uh is, how's the sound is this good mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. and then you're so you're just just being like you can see people so clearly and you know if it's working or not and i love it because it makes me really try to like win an audience and if you can win people in that situation, and I, I mean like win people, meaning like communicate yeah. properly, make then, a connection, make a connection, then you, you're you're doing it. Like your you your 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 finger is on the source of the song. And so that's yeah. So last night was another occasion of just like, all right, can I do it? And I always have a moment before I play where I'm just like, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And every time in New York, it's like I'm scared. Like, I'm so scared because it's, there's so many things against you and, and I failed so many times. Yeah. It's like, can I pull off a victory? So it's a challenge and I, I like it. I, I, I love it and I hate it, but you got to do it. How would you say John Paul's theology of the body has influenced your art? Because you went from that retreat with me in 2001. Yeah. Where ninety eight percent of it went over your head, but nonetheless, some seeds were planted. Mm -hmm. Then I meet you a few years later, and you said, "Yeah, I've been reflecting on this, and that weekend really started something that changed my life." And how did how has learning theology of the body informed your your art? Right away, very practically, the the um, receptivity was the first major thing that. Theology of the Body did for me artistically. The whole idea of an action being receptive, an action being surrender, like being actively surrendered, mm -hmm. um, was huge because I realized that... Can I, I lay that out yeah, theologically yeah, first, please, and yeah. then you can launch on how that yeah. impacted your music? So, so in JP2's teaching, which is not just his teaching, but the whole teaching of the Christian tradition... There's this analogy in the Bible that God is the bridegroom and humanity is the bride. And the idea is that St. John says, this is love, not that we first love God, but that he first loved us. And this puts the creature, whether you're male or female, this puts the creature in a posture of receptivity before God. And this is why John Paul II says, woman is the model and the archetype of the whole human race. Because to be human means to open, to receive divine love, conceive divine love, and bear it forth. That's the theology of a woman's body, right? So this is the theology behind what Mike is saying about, as an artist, learning to be receptive. Because And, and so unfold what that means as an artist. Yeah, so be, prior to that, um, really internalizing. I was writing songs in, kind of in a graspy way. I knew I needed to write songs. I felt like I wanted to, but I was really grasping at the songs. And so what that means is I would sit down, I'd say, I need to write. And I would sit down and just force myself to push it out. But it was so choked. It, it, was, it wasn't flowing. And you would see it. Like mm -hmm, you could mm -hmm. hear it. I could hear it, you mm -hmm. know? 
um, once I open myself up to this whole idea of no, just surrender yourself, then it flipped it to where it said, when it comes to you, right, always make yourself available to, to record in that's in the broader sense to copy, to write something down. If you do that, you're just fishing, you're gathering and you're it's like over time, you're just allowing things to naturally inspire you and come to you, which is really kind of how God works, right? You realize something when you step on the bus, you realize something when you're at the fruit market, yep, right? Yep. Uh, and record those things somehow. And then, but make an effort then at some point to take that like sack of thoughts and play it on the table and see what you have. And that to me was a huge difference than just, I need to write, I need to write yeah, yeah, yeah. versus, okay, it's been a couple months here are some ideas, what works, like what's the puzzle that I can put together and then continue that idea forward. So, okay, here's, here's a, a chord progression and here's a melodic, melodic concept. And here is, is okay. A chord progression, melodic concept, take that. Okay. I'm going to play it. I'm going to sing the melody. And naturally these words are kind of marrying themselves to the melody. And so you kind of find, uh, Bono talks about, they call it Bangalese. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's just that, like, I'm just going to put, I'm just going to flesh out the melody. And by doing that automatically words kind of like yep. work the best. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and so you just do that. And more often than not, what you are, your Bangalese is the best option lyrically. Yep. yep. And so it's not a cop out, like it's happening organically. And then you have that lyric and you say, wow, that lyric actually resonates with me right now because it means ABC and I'm going through, you know, this and that totally works. But then if that's it, if that's all you have, stop. It's okay. Yeah, you don't have yeah. to write two lines. You have one line. Yeah. A I, I had that experience. I haven't written a song in 20 years, but I used to write songs. And I remember this time, just as you're describing, I had a chord progression and I'm doing the working out a melody yeah. and I'm just finding words that fit with the melody I'm hearing. And I had this, how I needed a friend. Th those words just came out, how I needed a friend. And it, the melody worked, the words worked. And I crafted this whole song around those words about how I met my wife and how we got married. And I think it was it was one of the, the best songs I've, I've ever written. And yeah. you know those moments where you're like, I'm open to something. I'm open to some inspiration here. I'm not grasping at it. I didn't write this out of a, a I got to do it. it. It's something that I've received. Yeah. I mean, how many musicians talk about this experience when, I mean, U2 talks about yeah, just, God shows up in the room, yeah. right? And something happens that we we were open to, but we didn't do it. It came through us it's it's a real inspiration it really is and it, i'm not gonna like go down the path of like it was written in the stars but like there is a reality of there's a right way to play the concepts there's a right way for the concept to materialize and there's a wrong way and the brilliant artists know how to push that just to that ledge of this is this almost doesn't work but yeah, it yeah. does and because of that it's brilliant like that's like for me that's tom waits like, one second hey different. thomas could you grab me a copy of god is beauty yeah, the retreat mm -hmm. for me thank you i was just reminded of something you wrote uh, a chapter of a reflection on jp2's retreat yes that we published last year called god is beauty and i'm reminded of a scene in there that you wrote about where you were after a show uh, you got a recording of your show. Yes. And kicked, you listened to by it. by the Blue Mule. Yeah, 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 yeah. So tell, tell that story. <laughs> yeah, so there's this venue in, in uh, Denver, Colorado called the Blue Mule that when you would play, it was a bar that really kind of favored music, so it was a nice setting for musicians. And when you would play, they would record it and then give you a CD afterwards. Right. And then uh, you had your little CD and what you want to do with it, do whatever you want. Um, but yeah, so do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, keep yeah, going. So, so, you know, like you're excited, you're amped. I just played a show. And for me, like I can't sleep after shows, so I drive, Thanks. right? And so I played the show at the Blue Mule and it ended probably around like 12 in the morning. And then I drove a little bit, a couple hours just to get some miles. And I put the CD in and it kicked me in the face because it sounded horrible i could hear all my shortcomings i could hear like 
going back to silence as an instrument, I was not allowing silence to have any say in the conversation, like zero. I was filling space sonically too much. And it really was hard to listen to. And I knew like, so it was humbling. Oh yeah. I was but, like, but I, I you can't share, believe. you share in, in the book here, how that was a turning point yeah. in, in your life as an artist. Press into that a little bit. Well, it kind of le it kind of solidifies what, what TOB did. The one thing, there's a second thing TOB did for my music, but the first thing being on like re being receptive, it made me realize that, Hey, if you want to have a conversation with people, if music is an effort to have a conversation, then listen, mm, mm. stop talking, mm, good. <laughs> just, just shut up, like just be quiet. And what that means in practice is like, you don't have to fill space. You can like play a chord and let it resonate and sit. And if it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable for people, that's fine. Yeah. Because conversations can be uncomfortable. We can't shy away from it. And that it's just, a, it's a, it also is like part of my, personality to always want to make sure are you okay is everybody yeah, okay yeah. but like it's okay not to make sure people are okay it's okay if they don't understand it it's okay if if um you know it it if it demands a little more from people that's fine would you think this is correct to say that in making use of that silence in your music where you let the chord resonate and you're not just trying to continually fill space the reason it's uncomfortable this is what I want you to yeah. say if you think I'm right or not, is because you're inviting vulnerability. Yeah. You're being vulnerable. Yes. I've seen you do this over and over again yeah. in your music where you make yourself so vulnerable, so naked. And there have been times where I have been scared for you. You've been so naked in your music. Yeah. And that's my own. But then I was like, he's... I know that's the kind of music that reaches me. That's yeah. what I was saying earlier about the way you sing. You sing from that place of vulnerability and, and longing. Okay, so to speak into that, yes, 100%. And that vulner that silence, I just, just realized hearing you talk, the silence isn't for the listener's experience. The silence is for me. Mm. It's because it, it makes me vulnerable so that I can deliver the intention of the song, where the song came from. If I'm, if I'm here, if I made the effort to be here, then, then I'm going to take it seriously. And in order for me to do that, I need to be uncomfortable so I can open up. Um, but it's so hard because like in order to do that, there's an agreement. Yeah. So one really easy way to test out the agreement is be silent. And if you're silent as an audience and I'm silent, okay. Let's have a conversation. That reminds me of a video you sent me some years ago. Uh, I forget even who it was. It was some musician who interrupted his show. It's Jeff Tweedy. Jeff Tweedy. Of Wilco, yeah. Yes, interrupted his show to, to basically call the audience <clears throat> to task. To, uh, yeah. Press into so, that. Okay, so yeah, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco was occasionally plays solo shows. And when he does, he's a funny dude. So people often like banter, like yell stuff out. And it's funny and stuff, and he can, like, work with it. But, uh, and I just experienced this recently. I saw um, Ryan Adams uh, uh, live, solo. Not to be confused with not Brian, Brian Adams. Adams. Right. But um, Tweety was doing the same thing, where, like, people are just, they, they're uncomfortable with it. So they're, you know, the, the occasional, like, finish song, and then some guy's like, Woo! <laughs> play this! Like, they're just, it's like, you don't have to do this. He's yeah, going yeah. to play. Yeah. It's, it's literally the, the agreement is he's sitting in front of you going to play. So just watch. And he gets to the point where he's like, it's so obnoxious how many people are calling out and whistling and calling, you know, they think they're not in the moment. They're, they're not, not receiving the, the music. And he just said, he's like, guys, I'm what he says. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen him. He's like, what can I possibly do? What else can I give you? Yeah. I'm here. Like I'm, I'm going to do it. But guys, if you realize if we're all just quiet, for a minute, we can all hear our little heartbeats from yeah. all these different places that we came from together as one. And if you just allow it to be silent, mm. it can move you. We can mm. do something collectively. And then he says, I'm just going to be quiet. And he stands and he folds his arms. And like no one dared to yell at that point because like, He's, he's challenging them. Can you do this? So I was, I saw Ryan Adams last week 
and it was the same thing where he was literally like in the middle of a song and he's like, ma'am, if I can hear you, everyone around you can hear. And he's calling people out. And, you know, initially people are like, who's this? Like, come on, dude. But I was like, no, like he's right. He's in order for him to take off his shoes. It needs to be somewhere that it's appropriate to take his shoes off. You can't go there. If the frame is messed up, yes, but yes. if the frame is proper, then the picture res- it pictures vibrant. And aren't they saying Tweety and Ryan Adams? Aren't they? Aren't they basically saying, "Hey, music uncovers the buried way to the heart if we let it." Yeah, we can have an experience here of real heart-to-heart communion if we're willing to go there. Yeah, uh, and that's that's the invitation that is is scary. Um, and this is why I think maybe it's we're not going deep enough when we just treat music as entertainment. Which it can be. It can and be. That's and okay. there's a place for yes. that. But music can take us much deeper than mere yeah. entertainment. Uh, a movie can take us much deeper than mere entertainment. And I think that happens. I'm going to riff off the title of your section here in the book. So for those who don't know, Carol Wojtyla, before he became Pope John Paul II, This was in 1962. He gave a retreat to artists in Krakow called God is Beauty. And we here at the Theology of the Body Institute, we just published this last year. We got the permission from the Vatican to translate it into English and to publish it in English for the very first time. And we've uncovered this treasure, kind of a long lost treasure from St. John Paul II, this retreat he gave to artists. And Mike wrote a reflection, uh, as did I. I wrote many reflections in here as well. But you pulled out one line from Mm -hmm. Wojtyla's retreat, and you titled your reflection based on this one line, a stream of beauty flows through you, but you yourself are not beauty. You are not beauty itself. Unpack that and what that means as an artist, and where artists can go off in the wrong direction here, perhaps. Well, yeah, so so going back to like how songs are kind of like, there's like a right way to do an idea. There's a right way for something to be developed. Right, right way being like when it works, it, it works. And oftentimes as a, as a, well, I'll say co-creator, but I saying co-creator being because God's creator. So we're just participating in the process. But like as a, as a creator, you, when it works, it's easy for you to feel like it works because you, you're really good right. and you're not really good you're just really in tune with uh allowing your gifts to participate in co-creation that's really what's happening and so it's easy for us to be like man i'm really i'm doing this and i'm look at that person loving what i'm doing and man look at these fingers go like do you guys see this like check it out it's so easy to do that but the reality is it's it has nothing to do with you like if if what you're trying to do is show off material then you're an idol. You're a golden right. calf. Right. But if what you're trying to do is use material to transcend, then you're creating an icon. You're allowing the gifts that you've been given to point people into something bigger than yourself. And that's going back to the beginning of the conversation. That's always been what I was interested in as a, as a kid. I wanted the icon. I didn't know it at the time, but that's what it was doing. It was drawing me out of myself right. and bringing me into a conversation that I felt but I couldn't understand. So, so to summarize, the artist is co-creator with the creator yeah, and is allowing beauty, capital B, God is beauty, allowing divine beauty to flow through you as a co-creator. Yeah. And when, when the art, and I know this as, as a presenter, as a teacher, um, and as an artist, I do some music still. Um, when I, when I'm in a state of, they speak of a state of flow or, or you're in the zone, you are receiving a gift that's flowing through you and you're sharing it with others. Yeah. And it does lead to this, it uncovers those places to the heart, that journey to the heart, and you have this real communion. And people are grateful to you yeah. that you opened their hearts and shared with them beauty. Here- that, There's a great example. One of my favorite sounds in music is Bono during Bad, the original recording, Mm -hmm. 
when in between lines he gives like a Ugh! Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. yes i know exactly you know what yes. i'm saying that's yes. one of my favorite sounds yeah when i would play the song with my band we would play that song bad and i would when i got to that point yep. go <laughs> and it sounded horrible yeah because it right because it you're Not imitating i was imitating right i was materializing an authentic moment right and i was right, trying right. to capitalize which makes it inauthentic and authentic completely right but like when when you're in a moment that's why i love van morrison because van morrison you know he'll be singing and go, really wrong really it's just like he like it comes from right, underneath right, and right, he right. says nothing. He says like jargon and you're like, yeah, I feel bad too. <laughs> At that moment, I feel that it's that open channel. It's allowing, it's allowing the inspiration, the, ins- the breath, the God's breath yeah, yeah, come yeah. in and like not claim it, but step into the stream and allow it to, to rush past you and cooperate with yes, it. Yes, yes. And, and to say yes to it, yeah. even if what comes out of your mouth is... <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's like a groaning in the spirit. Yeah. It's it's the spirit praying in us with words, or without words, like beyond words, inexpressible, comes out in groans. And, and there is no doubt, Mike, there are times in your music where you are lined up with that, and there is a stream of beauty flowing through you. Yeah. When the artist, as you were saying, when the artist thinks, I'm it, yeah, then then you're setting yourself up as if you were God, right? Yeah, when it starts and stops with you, it's really not that interesting. Yeah. Because you're not that, I mean, like, you're beautiful, but, like, it's, 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 it's a bigger pasture if you open up the gates. Would you say that moment from the Blue Mule, when you were listening to your own recording and you were having a wake-up call, like... Oh, I'm not as good as I thought I was. Was that a was that a, a turning point in being willing to become that open to that stream of beauty? Do you think there was some element of trying to be the beauty versus yeah. being 100%. a conduit of the beauty? Yeah, what I heard was I was trying to influence I was trying to manipulate an audience the way that I have been inspired by music. I wanted people to feel the same way that I feel when I hear uh, right, right. Jeff Buckley or Tom Waits. I, 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 it opens me up, and I wanted to give that. To, it's a good intention, right, right. But it's poor, poorly executed. And so I didn't. When I heard that CD, I didn't necessarily have the answer. I just knew that what I was doing was not it. Therefore, I needed to like turn myself on to okay, then what? And that's when Tob T- was. I said, there's two things. The first thing was the surrender. The second thing was understanding that it's okay to have the conversation, right? Right, So many times we're afraid of having the conversation. We want to be glitter and gold and polished, but that's not where faith exists. That's the fruit of faith, but faith exists in the valleys. Yes, yes, yes. It's easy to, to... to come across as somebody inspirational when you have the answers, but it's the questions that I'm more interested in. And so art has that way of dwelling in that Valley and that's fine. Cause John Paul II says, even in those moments, it's the prayer of agony. Like that's the, you're having the conversation. My God, my, my God, why have you forsaken me is, is happening in any story that reflects on what it means to be human. And so when I realize that that's okay, then it's okay for me to continue listening to these this music. It's okay for me to write songs like this, and it's okay for me to have that conversation in real time with an audience. So, like, I I come from the Americana background, so folk, blues, country, um, you know, that kind of music. And historically, in the United States, that was always uh, music that preserved culture, right? That's where the stories right. dwelled right. from the Isles and from Ireland and England and, and all that stuff. So when I was first getting into my faith, it was like, so you're Christian now? You should listen to Christian music. Yeah, yeah. What is, it's a genre, right? And you go like this, and it means, and you just, you kind of go back and forth. Fine and good. It has a place. But that's not where I was being uh, engaged. Yes, yes. I was being engaged in the the stories. And so Americana music, it, it all just kind of dwells in the narrative, and the narrative is something we can all learn from parables 
stories. Yes. That's Amen. how we, Amen. we, we <laughs> attach ourselves to these stories right. because one of my yeah, favorite, Jesus li- evangelized with stories. Yeah. Hello. If he told you exactly what the, the point, right. Right. you'd be like, I don't understand. Right. right. I work with I work with hay. Right. right. Can, you, can you relate I'm a farmer. It to, to the Related sheep. to my life. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. I know. Yeah. So that's what you do. That's what you do so well. And that's why your music connects with her. That's why your music reached that deaf woman. Yeah. Because of your willingness to be vulnerable and to open, surrender, have the conversation, as you were saying, which puts you in a place of vulnerability to receiving an inspiration that genuinely came out of you in a groaning prayer through your song yeah. that vibrates through the floor, up her feet, into her legs, into her heart, and splits her open. Even yeah. though she didn't hear it, she felt it. Yeah. That's the power of music. Can I, can I riff on this a little bit more? Absolutely. So Pope Benedict, if I may return to him again, Return to him again. Is that redundant? Am I repeating myself? Am I saying the same thing over and over again? Return to him. Have you returned to him before? Re- return to him again before I did. Will after you, that, you did. If you return to him already, it's time we do it again. Time we do it exactly. That's, yeah. That's what I was trying to yeah, say. I get it. So let me do that. He says <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. You're being vulnerable. I, I like am. it. He says that a musical instrument is human intelligence drawing out of a tree. Mm-hmm. Drawing out of brass, right? What is brass? Uh, it's melted rock, right? What is a violin? Uh, what is what is making you weep when you hear a beautiful violin solo? Well, let me tell you what you're hearing. You're hearing hairs mm-hmm. plucked from a horse's ass, vibrating, being rubbed against sheep guts, dried out and stretched out over a hollowed out piece of tree, right? Uh, that's what a violin is. A, a good violin, the the bow is made out of horse hair, uh, ho- hair from a horse tail, right? And and the strings of a good violin are dried out lamb guts. You you just you just explained what art is. It's a lot. It makes sense. Experienced. Yeah. Describe. Yeah. Describe. Right. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> but that's what's happening. Yeah. But what what Benedict says is. Music is human intelligence drawing out of the elements of creation, horse hairs, lamb guts, melted rocks. That's what guitar strings are, right? Melted Mm -hmm. rocks. Um, uh, A flute. Think Think of a flute. What is a flute? Melted rock that you are blowing through. But what he say what he says is there is already music that the creator has put into creation. Mm-hmm. Because the word was made flesh. What does that mean? The Greek word that we translate word, word was made flesh, is logos. And, and the logos is the logic, the purpose, the meaning, the reason behind everything. What makes a rock a rock? What makes a tree a tree? Uh, what makes a lamb a lamb? What makes a horse a horse? There is a logic to a horse. There's a logic to a lamb. There's a logic to a tree. That logic behind that logic is the logos. And the logos, the logic, the reason, the purpose, the meaning behind everything, this is the Christian proposal, entered into the world he created through a woman who had to open and say yes and be vulnerable, as we were saying earlier, a bride said yes, and God enters his creation through her womb. And the incarnation means not only that flesh, human flesh now, communicates the mystery of God, but extends it extends to all of creation. And Pope Benedict says that when we make music, we are drawing the logos out of, of the melted rocks. We are drawing the logos out of the horse hairs. We are drawing the logos out of that hunk of hollowed out tree in a guitar or in a violin or a piano or whatever instrument you're playing. You are pulling the music out that God has impregnated in to creation. And he speaks of the musification of the logos as a kind of incarnation. Now, 
these are fancy words. Are these the words we use every day? No, but we feel it. What do we feel? He says, when you feel music and it splits you open on the inside, well, let me just quote him again. He says, he says, music uncovers the buried way to the heart, the core of our being, where it touches the being of the creator and the redeemer. When, when, when our hearts, when that deaf woman's heart was vibrating because your heart was vibrating and it came through the floor and it went up her feet and her heart was like, ah, oh, something's happening to me. Yeah. What's happening to her? The Logos is taking flesh in her. The Word is being made flesh in her. Uh, music is, is opening this way to the core of her being. And he goes on to say, wherever this is achieved, when the heart is cracked open through music, and again, he's not, making, he's not saying it only happens in church music, wherever this is achieved, uh, you know, Ratzinger, Benedict, was a huge fan of, of classical music, uh, Beethoven and Bach, and, and, and he, he speaks of going to a, a concert. Uh, it was not sacred art, it was, it was classical music. And, and say, he's saying, it was a proof of God's existence for me. Yeah. Because it reached this place in my heart where, where the Word was made flesh in me. What, one of my favorite uh, lines that touches on that is, and I think you, I think you saw the documentary about Glenn Gould. Yes. Who was a very vocal atheist. Yes. It, it just he was. But somebody in, in, the, in this documentary said, watching him was proof of God's existence. Yes. Yes. And that's you. You become music is a an incarnation of something spiritual. I mean, think how think how viscerally physical music is. We're yeah. talking vibrating horse hairs and lamb guts on a hollowed out tree that sends sound waves through the air. It goes into your ear and vibrates some membrane inside your skull, and all of a sudden you're weeping with deep emotion. Music is the, the touch point between the spiritual and the physical in a very concrete way, which, which is a promise that, that we can encounter God not by leaving this physical world. We don't have to transcend this physical world to get to God. He's in it. He's here. It doesn't mean the physical world is God, but that God has chosen to enter it. This is where... This is where theology, music, and evangelization all come together. And I'm putting a fancy, I'm putting fancy words to it, but you and I know this viscerally in our first encounter yeah. when we met and we sat down with a guitar and just shared songs for two and a half hours and a bond formed between us that, I mean, almost trying to put it in words is, is a disservice because you just have to reverence that, that unspeakable thing. One of my favorite, Tom Waits, I love Tom Waits, and when he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, he says, music is just something fun to do with the air. Mm. The, why that's potent is because it's not that simple. Right. That's the point. It's not something just fun to do with the air. Right. It's so much more, and he knew that. Yeah. So, like, when you say that, yeah, it's, and that's, that's, a, that's another reality is that, like, specifically the human voice, it's not, you're not, you don't hear the physical, you hear the, the wind, you right. hear the, the, the air. That's what's making the right, sound. Right, right, So it's not even the person. It's still the air that's making the sound. <laughs> Which again, breath, spirit, the connection between uh, the physical and the spiritual. Mm. This is the gift of, of art. And, and I can say without a doubt that when I was in some of my darkest moments of my life, it was the willingness of very vulnerable artists to be naked in their art. And for me, it was Springsteen, it was Bono, uh, listening to their music in some very dark moments in my life saved my life. Yeah. And when I, when I met you, Mike, and I started hearing your music, and I mean, you've heard me say this before, but I, I mean it. I mean it like your music did the same thing for me that Bono and Springsteen did for me because you had that vulnerability and you were willing to go to that place in your soul and sing from that place that uncovers the buried way to the heart 
which becomes, whether we have the language for it or not, it becomes an encounter with our Creator yeah. and our Redeemer. And God uses it to, to reach us. And I feel so privileged, and I'm, I mean this, and I want you to hear me say it again. I know you've heard me say it before. But I feel so honored and privileged to be able to, to work so closely with you, to travel the world with you, and to share your music with, with the audience that uh, you know, came out to learn more about the theology of the body. And they don't know maybe exactly why Mike Mangione's there. Yeah. And they don't know what's about to slap him upside the head. When I don't you... even know why I'm there <laughs> half the time. <laughs> when you get up there, <laughs> when you get up there and you crack open your heart and this beauty pours out and you become a, a riverbed where this stream of beauty flows through you, I have the privilege of seeing that over and over and over again. There's a moment in our Made for More event. It'll happen tonight. When you get up there, there are two moments, and I know you already probably know the moments I'm talking about, but it's in your song, um, uh, your song, your song, I'm having a brain love fart. Love Me Falling. Love Me, Can You Love Me Falling? When, when you, you just open it up, and that vulnerable vocal, and, and I'm like, is he going to go for it? Is he go-? And you've shared with me, you know, yeah. you have a limited number of times in your life yeah. that you can hit that note, because yeah. it demands so much of you. It's fleeting. It's fleeting, yeah. and you go for it night after night when we do these events, and I'm uh, that crescendo of your voice where your voice slides into that ah uh, that most vulnerable moment, and I'm praying for you, and I'm praying for our audience that they are open to the beauty that is flowing out of you. And something similar happens when you sing at your gate, and you open it up, and. I know lives have been changed, hearts have been opened, that buried way to the heart has been uncovered Mm -hmm. through your willingness to go there, event after event that we do together. And I, 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 please hear me say it again, Mike, what an honor. And, you know, we do it, you know, we do these events a lot and, and it can become, okay, here comes another one. But every night before we go out together, we say that prayer. Lord, make it fresh, make it, make it new for us. And I'm reminded of a, a line, again, forgive me for quoting from Bono so much, but... Um, you don't have to apologize for quoting Bono. Okay, Are you going to say, <laughs> No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, he says, when he's at a concert, when he's doing a concert, he says, I have to hit the high, high notes. notes to keep me honest. Yes. And, yeah. and I know when you go for it and you hit those high notes, you're doing it to... To be honest, yeah. to be vulnerable, yeah. To be and real. I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to say that there have there have been times in my performance history where I haven't done them because I don't feel safe. Yeah, I don't feel safe going yeah. there. And like I've literally had moments in my head where I'm approaching the note and I'm like, again, this is not right. I'm just being honest. Yeah, where I've thought they they don't deserve they it. don't deserve it. Yeah. No, I get it. I get. It. I mean, I'm the same way when when I'm presenting. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody who knows been to any event that I've ever presented at, I tend to break into song because yeah. it's song opens the heart. And I've been in front of audiences where it's almost like they won't let me sing. Yeah, they are not open to it. And 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 I don't want to be that naked if you're not going to receive me in that place. So I know exactly what what you're getting at. Yeah, it's it's vulnerability and it require it's a relationship and um I wonder if you guys want to show some music videos. Right yeah, now. we do. Uh, oh, okay, okay. So Yeah, well let's let's talk about your album. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can I can segue right into this. And let's talk about this this video. And do we need to tell that guy to stop blowing his leaf blower? Is that coming through? Yeah, I'm going to go I'm going to go tell him. Okay. Do it with a ag- uh, do it very aggressively. Yeah. Of course, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> Tell him what a jerk he's being. Okay. I don't know if you guys can hear, but there's a leaf blower blowing outside our studio. I'm going to leave the camera on you. It's good for... Okay. So let me, uh, let me tell you my impressions of okay. this album. Blood and Water by Mike Mangione. So that's, I assume, that's a reference to, maybe a veiled reference to the blood and water from the heart of Christ. Never I... thought of that, but ne- that's good. <laughs> 
So uh, the first song, Anastasia, is... Can I say it really quick, though? Yes, but it, you're saying it without the camera on you. That's be- fine. That's fine. My voice is, is good enough. It's Sacrifice and Birth. Sacrifice and Birth. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, they're linked. The, the sacrificial gives birth, right? Powerful. Yeah, that's blood and water for yeah. me. Sa- sacrifice being the source, uh, the vulnerability, the, the life, st- the, the, the bloodstream, literally, and water being the baptism, the rebirth, the source, the life. So they're, they're intertwined. Well, so there it is. There is the artistic presentation right there of the whole theology of the divine mercy. And what nine times out of ten is going to reach the heart more directly? A theological talk on the divine mercy or an artist who is singing from that place and his song becomes an actual encounter? Yeah, it's exemplifying. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, okay, you, you were talking about the So album. our producer is now back, and the camera is now flippable again, I and we got that leaf blower to shut up. There, there, I, have a, I have a specific segue for Anastasia, specifically the video that ties this all together, but, but you were about to say some things about the record. I, I was going to say some things about the record. <laughs> Mike, I'm, I'm not kidding, and you know this about me. When, when I get a new Mangione album... Chuck Mangione? Put it in front of your face. Put it in front of my face. When I get a new... Man, and, Come on, focus. When... When I get a new Mangione out, focus, focus, focus. There it there is. You go. There it is. When I get a new Mangione album, I am as excited as when U2 or Springsteen come out with a new album because I know it's going to feed my soul. Mm. And I have never been let down on a new Mangione release. It feeds my soul and it gets in there. And you and I are very particular about yeah. albums. Like, like we want the visceral experience of of holding the CD, right? Uh, yeah. Holding for me when I was a it's the word made fresh, is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, it is. It's an incarnational experience. I miss the days of going to the album store, right? I, I used to walk from Sacred Heart School. Just do this for I would, hours. I would have to, I mean, you know, the whole world now listening to music, you just pull out your phone and get what, you have access to millions upon millions of albums at your disposal. You actually used to have to pay cash. I would walk from my school to Stan's Record Bar in Lancaster, PA, and, and check out what the new albums were. And mm-hmm. I knew exactly what my favorite bands were and where they were in the record store. And I'd go through and- You're like, Michael McDonald, Michael McDonald, where is it, where is it? <laughs> yeah, I get it, I get it. And, and I, I remember the, the, the smell of the record store. I remember the feel of the floor Sacram- under my shoes. All of it's sacramental. Yeah. All of it. Music is sacramental. That was, that was, for me, the major turning point when I heard when I first started dating my girlfriend at college, she brought one of the first things she did is brought me to mass at St. Joan of Arc Chapel in Milwaukee at Mar- on Marquette's, Marquette's campus. Right. St. Joan of Arc Chapel is a small little chapel that was brought over brick by brick from France via England. And it said that there's one brick there that she prayed upon before she went off the battle that's huh. in that chapel. And I remember she, Stacy, my wife, brought me to this Wednesday night, 10 p.m. mass. And I remember it's, first off, it, it's a it's a tiny chapel from France. It, so it looks amazing. You walk in these big, heavy doors, and the and the, the stones are worn from mm, centuries. Mm, right, right. There's candle, it's all illuminated by uh, a candlelight. It was packed with students, and they were singing chant. Uh, and there was uh, incense and uh, 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 Father uh, Will Prospero delivering the word in, in, in the way that he would. He passed. I'm a little emotional. But yeah. um, but I, I remember uh, entering into that space and just um, being hit by the sacramentality of everything, like candlelight meant something. Yeah, yeah. Incense meant something. Singing meant something. And this is coming from a guy that, like, when I go to mass, I'm like, can you just not do the songs? Yeah, can we just, yeah. get, <laughs> just get to the word? Like, it meant something. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is what rock and roll is trying yes. to be. So, so 
that visceral experience you just had and the emotion it stirred in you speaks is is the lived experience of everything we've been talking about for the last hour about the power of art mm -hmm. about the power of beauty to crack us open and and what you were doing in your room when you were a teenager with the lights and the incense and the music it was a long whether you you didn't have the words at the time but those two experiences that little sanctuary you created in your room and that experience of walking in Joan of Arc chapel they are they are the same. same and and we <laughs> This is what we're trying to do at the Theology of the Body Institute yeah. through our events. We're trying to create an encounter with beauty through the Word made fresh. fresh. <laughs> through, the, <laughs> through the Word made flesh, through music, yeah. through... When we do our events, we have the big screens, we have the visuals, we have your music, we have the spoken word. You got the cables that fly the, off to the fly, audience. Right, fly through the You're audience like, like Bon Jovi. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on the drum set like Tommy Lee. Right, on down. living on a prayer. Yeah. We're halfway there. Jock strap. <laughs> you so always have to... That's what he wore. Sorry. Okay, this is what I have to deal with. Sorry. All the time. That's how we say and it in it's, Wisconsin. it's why Sorry. I love him and it's why I hate him. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, what I... Mike, so you're a goofball... And and then you're willing to to let the tears flow. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of your humanity. And that beauty always comes out in your music. Yeah, which is why I'm never let down by an album. And I've I I need to spend more time with this. I haven't had I haven't done my deep dive. And you and I are very particular with albums. Like it be this will be the soundtrack of the fall of 2022 for me. Yeah. Um, because I'm going to do the deep dive, and I've done like three run-throughs of the album, and and I it's very particular for me. First run-through, I'm just receiving. I'm I'm letting the the melodies sink in for the first time, and then the second run-through an album, I'm like, yep, I remember that melody. I really liked it. Oh, I remember that lyric. Really like. Oh, I I, I love that guitar sound. The third time through, I'm starting to like kind of marinate in it a little more. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm right at that phase where I'm marinating in these songs. And I'll tell you that my, my standout songs. Anastasia, uh, Giving Up On You. Ain't, and, ain't Giving Up On You, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Ain't Giving Up On You. But you called it Giving Up On You. Right, right, because Ain't is a silly title. It's silly to have Ain't. Yeah, but it's Ain't Giving Up On You. Yeah. And then um, Old River Flowing has yeah. also had a big impact on me. But we want to talk about Anastasia. Well, okay. Because you have a, a, a beautiful video that my son, if I may... Be a proud papa for a moment. My son Thomas was your uh, videographer, Co collaborator, and collaborator, artistic collaborator on Anastasia. So Thomas, I don't know if you want to say something about it as well. And do we need these headphones here, Thomas? Can, can I? Before Thomas talk, let me just mention one thing. So, so what was so cool about? I was very intentional. Like, all right, um, we're physical. I might as well utilize that reality with the music, right? So let's make some videos. And Thomas was an awesome collaborator because he, he and I both understood what we we're trying to do and what the potential of the physical is. And so, you know, everything is an opportunity. Everything here is an opportunity to reveal, right? And so, um, the album, the colors, the title, the words, what I'm wearing, the location, the yep. video, everything is saying something. That's always how I, yep. it's, it's, oh, for yep. me, it's, I'm never licking stamps. There's yep. always a meaning behind everything. So specifically with like Anastasia, you know, the song, it's the first song of the record. The song is about clearly this woman is leaving. Don't you go, Anastay. He calls her Anna Stay, a nickname, but it's also a play, like Anna Stay. You know, her name's not Anna, but Stay, like be with me. And um, so like in the video, um, it was important for me, like I cannot dance. I'm horrible at dancing. It just, it's not, I just can't do it. And not only am I bad at dancing, like I mentally know that I'm bad. And if I'm ever moving in my Is there head, a wound there? Did somebody mock you when you were a child or something? I just... <laughs> Because you have rhythm. I mean, I've, you. every musician has rhythm. Yeah, but like, you know, uh, uh, there's nothing cool, There's nothing really cool about a really short, hairy Italian guy trying to be cool on the dance floor. Like, it's just, it, it, to me, it's, it's yeah, it's probably a wound, but um, we don't have enough time to talk All about right, it. We won't. No, I, I, don't, I don't have anything on top of my head. But like, so for me, 
the song, she's leaving and he's pleading, right? And so it was important, you know, if you're pleading, you can't mail it in. You have to go there. You have to get naked. Naked, vulnerable. You have to say, okay, here I am. And so with the video... I knew I wanted dancers because it's such a such a rhythmic song. Yeah, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna have the girls dance. And then when we were t- Thomas and I were talking about like, all right, what like when I'm the narrator singing, looking at the camera, what am I doing? I was really wrestling. Like I, I think I have to dance because if I'm the one pleading, I have to. You have to be vulnerable. I in have that to same be vulnerable. Place. Yep. And so the video is it's it's me as the narrator like li- like literally being like hey all right here we go. like moving i'm dancing and i'm not it worked i think it, it worked it does work but you know and 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 she's a dancer the woman in the narrative is a is a dancer you could see it early on in the in the video you see the the painting of a dancer it implies that she's a dancer and what is she doing she's running away from this relationship, but every relationship comes, you know, usually stems from a, 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 a who we once were, the good intention, the the dream, the the positives of the communication between man right. and woman. Right. But what happens over time? We we develop these calluses, we develop these scars, we start moving in different directions. And so he, out of an act of vulnerability, speaks her language, saying like, "Okay, like." I want, I want, I want to reach you. Here I go. Yeah. Is it like, and he's trying to like, to summon the echo of where they came from back into her heart. And so as she's traveling, like as she's running away, she keeps, she's like, she's made a decision. She's going, but every once in a while she gets a glimpse of like, it's, it's, it's actually your, your, so the woman in the video is your sister, Marion and her, her doppelganger doppelganger is your your daughter right because they look a lot alike yeah Yeah. and so like as she's like she's made this decision to run away from something she solidified which is her marriage she's running away from it but because she's like vulnerable and opening herself she keeps having little tinges of like remembering she sees herself and then eventually she makes eye contact with herself and 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 chases it what is that like oh my gosh what am I doing? Why? Wait, 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 wait. This is a this is a major reaction. I need to reflect on this. I need mm. to go back. And she she literally chases herself back to this room where we have been dancing, where the spirit has been flowing, mm. where the women have been dancing, and I join them, and I'm like opening myself up. And she opens the door, and it's empty. Mm. And she walks in. It's empty, but the spirit's still there. And she touches mm. the chair. Mm that I was sitting in and she, she, she remembers and she starts to move in remembrance of who she once was. So walk us through it. We're going to watch it together. And I and think Mike... I just did. <laughs> then I just walk it. You did. You yep, did. So but, that's, but uh, that's all folks. That's any additional commentary. Thomas, you have do you want, is... Cause Thomas, do you have any insight on the, on yeah, the you video? want to say anything, Thomas? Well, initially I think you hit on really all of the key points. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know that I have anything to add, but, other than the fact that um, just speaking kind of into what you were saying earlier about being receptive in the artistic process, I think one of the greatest joys for me in working on this with you, Mike, was that that was kind of what our meetings were is we, we would just for for probably like six months, every other week we'd be jumping on zoom and we just sit and we'd be like, it, it was just free flowing and open. And like, we were just tuning into what the song was saying and translating that into a visual language. Um, it's it's the, do you want to preach faith or do you want to live it? Right. We were literally being vulnerable in the in the process. I mean, yeah. we, we just said, all right, it is what it is. And the second video that we did, you didn't come here alone. It was, we were, I mean, we were saying, hey, let's just show up. Like we have an idea <laughs> of the concept, but let's just show up yeah. and see what happens. So, yeah. And it's kind of funny that you say that about you didn't come here alone because that's sort of how life happens. You know, yeah. you just show up and you're like, all right, we got an idea, but um, let's just go for it. All right. Let's let's play this video. And yeah, if you, um, if you guys want to lean in and maybe split those earbuds, um, 
that would probably help with the feedback. Uh, I, I, I know the song. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, maybe yeah, you, you can look, Christopher you can, can jump on them. All right. All, right. All right, we'll play it. Yeah, I just muted us. Do you want me to turn up the volume on the music? Because it's like I'm, way down. I'm okay. It's way down so that we can talk over it. Mm. So they're hearing it really quiet, assuming that we would give commentary. But do you okay. want me to turn it back up? Well, I can give commentary if that's... Yeah, go ahead. Give some okay, commentary. I'm, I'll un unmute you now. Now, you know, going back to what I just said, like he is in a state of confessional. And that's one thing I love with the videos, I've done that a couple times, is um, it's, it's, he's literally like in a confession, like against the screen, you know, against the light, looking down, avoiding, avoiding conference, like avoiding looking directly on more of a, like a reflective state. So that's what, and then eventually you're gonna see him transition from that to engaging and taking it head on to the point where he eventually walks out, fully uh, goes up, uh, you know, dancing uh, uh, head on. Mercy, mercy me. Oh, don't you go. I was blind. So she's about she's about to remember something from her past coming. Thomas, I even I remember at that that point I even asked you to remove that footage right there because I was, right. I was too embarrassed. <laughs> no, and I told you it's got to stay, like, Mike. No, it's it's got to stay. I'm so glad you said that. So here she's seeing herself. Yeah. You can see, this is like the moment of realization, a turning point. posturing he's confident in that place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so he's intentionally like i was trying to like i love uh flamenco yeah so i was trying to like tap into like some of that flamenco like po it's so much great posturing in flamenco like presence it's, it's confidence you know uh, the next step after vulnerability is owning it mm -hmm. he's owning it like here like this is like hey I'm here. It's actually my fists. <laughs> don't don't tell him how it's done. I know I'm not gonna be making sausage here. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but this is the moment where she comes back. You were saying that the empty chair and feels the the spirit of 
of the dance. She's remembering. Yeah, she's remembering the, the source of their relationship, and she's she's allowing herself to dwell in it and be there. And he's he's go, he's stepping out across that divide, and she's responding. I really love that imagery of the confessional screen. I didn't even, I mean, I know, I knew when we shot it that that worked and it meant something, but like you just kind of articulated it a moment ago. I think that that's, it's so rich. Yeah, you need a shovel to go there. And uh, that's what the confession is. <laughs> it's the shovel. Okay, so I, I, art makes art makes you so vulnerable. You're and you're putting your heart out there. I my mentor Monsignor Albacete used to say, if you really want to wound the artist, um, insult his art or attack his art, you'll hurt him much more than if you punched him in the head. Yeah, because because your your heart is is out there when you watch your own art here. And Thomas, you too, as the as the videographer and director of it. Yeah. And editor. And and editor, right. Yeah, and I mean we it was really a collaborative process from start to finish. Yeah. You you I'm sure though that when you're sharing that you're like, there's a little I'm putting myself out there. Will it will it be received? Um, it's interesting that you say that. I, I don't know what your thoughts are, Mike, but I feel like some the beauty of art done correctly is that the medium protects you. Hmm. Like now obviously there are gonna be really vulnerable moments and things that are closer than others, but that's what, like you were saying earlier about those moments when you don't feel safe on stage, where you don't want to go there. Yeah. Like, there are going to be those moments, but you're already on stage, like, and you wouldn't be able to be that vulnerable if you weren't pouring yourself into a medium. And like a medium, literally something, something mediating between you and the receiver, you know? Yeah, it frames the picture. It, it kind of explains why it's happening, you know? That's what, that's what why I love when you set up who I am at our events, because like, why is this guy? I remember we, we took, we had a survey and like, yeah. like comments for the survey after event was like, why was he playing the music that he was playing? Like, I don't understand the connection. And so when you properly frame something, people can dwell in it. Yeah. yeah. You know, you kind of help them exist in it as well. Yes. Um, but, but, but yeah. And, and, kind of, I, I kind of hinted at it when we were in the commentary of the video. It's like it, the first step is, is, is vulnerability. Second step is entering into it. And then third step is taking ownership of it. And there's a difference between cockiness and ownership, you know, and that's, it's such a beautiful thing when you could see an artist be fully committed to the vulnerability and they stand by it. Yeah. It's not boastful. It's not look at me. It's this is correct. It's it's an it's an affirmation of what just happened, and I think that was that was the key for you and I, Thomas, when we were working together. And it's it's kind of what you and I do, where you 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 say yes, that's it, because it's resonating without any dissonance. It's re it's the, the literally vibrating together. It's all that's proper. That's the way it should be. And that's a neat thing where you can hit that. And you know when you hit that. You just got some really good press in the in the secular music world. I remember reading this article. You sent it to me. What, where was that from? So it was some uh, music critic from Philadelphia. Oh, the... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are uh, you able to, to link us to that, Thomas? Or, or share the link? I don't yeah, even know what I'll, it's I'll put that in the description after yeah, the live yeah, stream. Yeah, Thomas will put it in the description. But I loved what he said. Like, he... This guy, whoever he was, this yeah. critic, music critic... He really understood your craft, and he really understood your gift, and he was he was high in praise. Like, yeah. and, and I love one of his lines, is something like, uh, "Mike Mangione was the epitome of smooth and cool," or something. In how did he say it? Do you remember? Um, 
he says something like, I think he said this guy's cool as hell, <laughs> <What's that>? which <laughs> is like, he, you know, I don't mind hearing that. I loved that. Yeah. No, Mike, to me, that made my heart sing that, yeah. that you were getting that kind of recognition. But that was, and, and for me, so when I read that, it didn't like, I didn't go, oh yeah. It, it's for me, it was like, he co- co- correct. Yes. He like, got it. Mike, you, you did, you, you did it. Like what? Cause that's the thing. Like you kind of work on these projects and then you step back and you're like, man, I hope that's good. Yeah. I have no idea if any of this is good until somebody says, hey, guy's cool as hell. It's, well, like, it's, a, it's right. an affirmation that you have become a stream of beauty. Yes, yes. That's what it is. Right on. And it doesn't go to your head because you know you're not beauty itself. Right. But you are a stream of beauty. And it reached this guy. And his reaction was, Mike Mangione was cool as hell. Yeah. That's, that's the communion took place. The connection took place between your art and... In his heart, and it became yeah. an uncovering for him of that hidden, hidden place to his own heart. Yeah, the hidden road to his own heart. How can people get this album, and how can people stay in touch with you and learn more about your music and the other albums you have? Yeah, so you can get the music at any streaming platform, Spotify, iTunes. But if they're incarnational people and they want to get my website, Mike Mangione. dot com. And we'll put that in the description as well. That was really complicated. Can you repeat that, please? Mike, man, G-I-1, Mangione. Man, G-I-1. I never yeah. thought about that. Yeah. I M-A-N-G-I-O-N-E. That's correct. And you are, we figured this out once, you are second cousin twice removed, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. of Chuck Mangione. Uh, he, he is second cousin twice removed of me. Of you. That's right. That's, That's how, how I look at it. I'm grumbly. Woo. Do you hear that? So we have to go have lunch, and then we have to drive off to our yeah. event in Baltimore tonight. Mm-hmm. Baltimore. Baltimore. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation between me and my good friend, colleague, brother in this work here, our artist in residence, Mike Mangione. He is also the director of our events. If yes. you want to bring a Made for More event to your area, Mike is the man to talk to about that. Could you put his... Uh, email Thomas in our description as well. You got it. In case somebody's interested in an event. And I want to put in a plug for my very talented son. If you are a musician and you're interested in having Thomas work on a music video for you, I didn't tell Thomas I was going to do this, but Thomas, can we uh, yeah. get some yeah. contact info? Sure, for you? yeah. Send an email to thomaswestfilms at gmail.com, and that'll be, um, that'll be in the description as well. Thomas, thomaswestfilms at gmail.com if Correct. you're interested yeah. in Thomas and his filming and editing skills. He's got them. He's was, got them. He's gift. got the chops. It was real, real honor to, to work. It was crazy that I was working with little Thomas that I've— when you first met him, he was five years old. Yeah. Now he's 23, and he is a very talented artist in his own right. Mm-hmm. Very, very fun. talented, yeah. Thank you, everybody. And hey, follow us here at our YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe if you haven't. Share this video if it blessed you. Thanks for tuning in. God bless. Thanks, Mike.